In this episode, we'll be talking about how service design has evolved in the last 17 years. We'll be talking about the relationship between service design and industrial design. And finally, about the potential and added value of service design. If you're interested in that, keep watching and here's the guest for this episode. Hi, this is Jill Regan uh, speaking on the Service Design Show and I'm really happy to be part of it. Hi all, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to the Service Design Show. If you want to create more impact and change the world for the better as a service designer, then you've come to the right place. Because on this show you get the chance to learn from the success of some of the world's leading service designers. We talk about topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring a brand new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, don't forget to click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is Gilles Rougon. Gilles is the executive board treasurer at the World Design Organization and he is the collective innovation catalyst at EDF where he leads collective innovation processes. For the next 30 minutes or so, Gilles will be talking about how service design has evolved, about the relationship between industrial design and service design and about the added value of service design. In case you prefer to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. But don't forget, here on YouTube you'll also get content that isn't available as a podcast. So that was it for the introduction, and now let's jump right in into the interview with Gilles. Welcome to the show, Gilles. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> it's an honor to have you here, and uh, I'm here in a very dark Utrecht for the people who are listening to the podcast. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's really dark. Um, you're based in Paris, right? Or close to Paris? Yes, I am uh, something like 80 kilometers uh, close to Paris. Yeah, and in the Netherlands, that's already a totally different country if we travel 80 kilometers, but that's uh, in, in France, that's, uh, that's not that far. So Gilles, um, the question I ask all my guests on their previous, I think 40 uh, episodes, 39, 40 episodes is, do you remember the very first time you heard something about service design? So when did you get in touch with service design? It was something like 18 or 19 years ago uh, when I was uh, on the one hand graduated as not only an engineer but a design manager and I joined uh, a company which was quite of an industrial company. And I thought that we had to really work on service design, dealing with new methodologies, new ways of working with different uh, skills. And it was year 2000. Did so it exist in 2000? That pe were people uh, really using the term service design? Definitely not, and I think I was seen like a weird guy. <laughs> I hope that changed a little bit. Yes, it it are uh, definitely, but uh, so transparently, when I joined a company called EDF Group, uh, which is an energy supplier, something like 18 years ago, when we really proposed to try to develop new methodologies mm. about service design in this kind of really engineering-driven company, it was quite of an amazing. Uh, <laughs> ID, I mean, for lots of people, yeah. and we did. I mean, we hired some people trying to understand in terms of research, in terms of methodologies, what would be interesting um, ways of working for uh, mm. in-house designers and service designers mm. to work for an engineering-driven company as service designers. And it was quite amazing. Yeah. Well, you know... Um, this is the service design show and as always we have three topics and I think the very first topic already uh, touches upon uh, what you're hinting up uh, upon here and um, I'll come up with the question in this interview um, and the topic is the journey of service design and I'll ask you uh, Gilles 
where did the journey of service design lead to for you in the last 17 years? Where, where has it led to? That's definitely a good question. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, first of all, something like 18 years ago, when we were talking about service design, it was in a company uh, which was an industrial design company driven. Hmm. Uh, uh, and we were just trying to develop new methodologies for in-house designers to make them uh, propose added value by design. And service design was part of the journey. But at the beginning, to be really transparent, we made a lot of mistakes. Mm. Uh, we failed a lot. We call and that so prototyping. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can. Uh, you're right. On the other hand, uh, what was interesting was the fact that, uh, you know, in the past, if you come back to the Bauhaus mm. school and uh, this kind of uh, graduating processes for industrial designers and so on, uh, the question was about how can you help uh, an industrial company or organizations to think differently about user experience and service design. Mm. And it was brand new, I mean, mm. can you imagine? It was mm. 20 years ago. And we, we thought that we had to develop new methodologies in a sector which is quite difficult because uh, dealing with energy issues, this is something really complex. You mm. have to work in a very complex ecosystem. And now I think lots and more and more in service designers are working in very complex situations. So the, the main question is about how can you make your decision makers mm -hmm. understand that if they work with service designers, they will, add, they will have more added value mm -hmm. than without working with them. That's a golden question, I think. A lot of people who are watching this episode would want to know how to do that. Have you found, you know, in this journey from the last 18 years, were there any specific milestones or turning key moments that you think, well, that were the moments that the decision makers saw the light or that their perspective on the value of design changed and what made that change? I mean, as designers, we have to be really humble. So first of all, we did our maximum during something like five to 10 years. But if we were quite, I mean, experts and able to make people understand which were our really uh, everyday work as service designers, it was quite difficult for people to understand exactly what we were delivering. Mm. So, first of all, I mean, people and your decision makers really don't understand exactly what you really deliver. Yeah. So it's yeah. difficult because we are, as service designers, working in very complex, multidimensional, uh, lots of uh, uh, decision makers involved um, ecosystems. So it's quite difficult to make it clear for some key decision makers to pay for your work. Uh, understand that you are key in the process. It yeah. was a case 20 years ago. Yeah. So we try to de to work and rebuild really new s processes for that. But now I think because I'm an old guy. I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but I learned a lot. And in my opinion, the main conclusion is that on the one hand, service designers are really key for our features, but they are too focused on explaining what they do, mm. how they do it, yeah. and not the added value they can add to any kind of organization, should it be a nonprofit or a private mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think this is the main uh, thing I learned. This, this has been really a key topic on the last few episodes. And that is that we talk 
so much about our methods, our tools, our processes, and there is so little conversation about um, the impact we make and the value we add, right? We, don't, we, we haven't really created a, a good vocabulary for ourselves to do that. I, I think so. Sorry, I have a call <laughs> in the meanwhile. So. Uh, my, I think the main question is about the difference between influence and power. It was your first. Yeah, well, uh, we'll get back to that topic. Don't, don't, uh, don't spoil. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it's a cheap teaser. To try to answer to your questions, um, everything in life deals with what you want to deliver. I mean, what you feel comfortable with to work on. Uh, and on the one hand, we are graduated wherever we come from as designers. And we think that we are able to change the world, which mm. is amazing. Mm. Just let me uh, share a very specific and simple situation. I was part of it uh, when I was young. Um, something like 10 or yeah probably 12 years ago if you are in an elevator mm. uh, with some people mm. I, and as a designer you meet for example or the financial director or the i don't know hr mm. director mm. whatever if you are a really convinced service designer, someone who really want to change the world, the only thing you want to share is about, hey, you guys, you have to understand I'm the best ever to change the world, which is not something that your contacts, the people you meet, are really to understand because they are not coming from your culture, they are not coming from your own methodologies and so on. So if I could have a really simple recommendation about what you can really propose to someone you meet. Imagine you are going to a, a coffee shop or a bar or mm -hmm. uh, a meeting some HR director, financial director, R&D director, whatever. The only question I ask you is about, as a service designer, what would you propose this guy or woman as an added value of use if only you only want one thing mm. I want you to have another meeting with this guy or this woman later on mm. so okay mm. you find an HR director you say okay I'm in, a, in the lift with is or her mm -hmm. and say okay Maybe uh, so nice, I meet you, I'm glad I meet you in the elevator, and yeah, what, what, what's your job? So I'm a financial director. Okay, great. As a service designer, I could help you probably um, really reformulate your dashboards and really think about the experience your teams could have with your dashboards, which is simple. If you are a designer, you would say, oh, I can change your world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is not the question. Well, and, and for this, I think what you're saying, uh, for me, the key there is that we really have to step into the shoes of our own clients. It's what we propose to our clients, that they step into the shoes of their customers. We have to do the same. We have to step into the shoes of our own clients and understand what their problems are and what their language is and what their culture is. And that's the only way we'll be able to connect, right? I fully agree because <laughs> we are, as designers and service designers, really keen on starting from observations, reformulating the ecosystem of stakeholders in order to deliver much more added value as service designers at the end. But sometimes what we forget is that the first person we have to apply this kind of methodologies are our first clients. R really, really listen careful to this because I think this is a really important piece of advice. Um, so let's move on to the second topic, because next to being a collective innovation catalyst, you're also an executive board treasurer for the World Design Organization. 
And um, the second topic is about the importance, and this is the importance of service design for the World Design Organization, right? Yeah, I agree. I fully agree. So uh, first of all, uh, to to put the context in, um, so I'm I'm quite uh, impressed and honored to be part of this organization. So the World Design Organization is coming from the industrial world. Yeah. It was early the uh, ICSID, so Industrial Design Organization, uh, really created in the mid. Um, I would say uh, last century. So uh, just for you to know, um, this organization is dealing with uh, people coming from different pillars, educational, companies, professionals, so that means agencies coming mm. from not, not only industrial design, but also service design, okay. uh, yeah. UX and so on, design and so on. And the main, sorry to be direct. Yeah, we, go ahead. <laughs> we, 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 we are facing as designers, wherever we come from, I mean, service design, UX design, uh, whatever, mm. industrial design, something which is, on the one end, really interesting, which is this kind of design thinking mood mm. and this, uh, ability of sea level to understand that Maybe by design we can reinvent ourselves, which mm. is great. The, ma the main question for me is that they think they could do that without designers, mm. which is something I cannot accept. Mm. Why? Because in my experience, on the one end, you have to have really interesting C-level people by the process and cultural process, mm. your changing process uh, by design. But on the other end, you need designers coming from industrial fields, service design field, uh, UX and so on, design fields and so on, to be able to really not only think at the big picture level, but also in the details of what we can deliver. And service designers are people who are really able to reconfigure the ecosystem mm. and the way a company, an organization, a nonprofit organization can deliver some added value. And on the other end, to go into details in the really end products, should it be a uh, user interface, uh, website, uh, blog, or mm. what? Yeah, the actual the, the actual touch point, designing the actual touch point, whatever Thanks. in which in whichever medium it is. What when you told me about this topic, I was really interested. Why is a organization that is that has a strong heritage in industrial design interested in service design, and what is their perspective on service design? So. How, how do people in the industrial design field look at this movement? So to be direct, I was elected not only as a, uh, an industrial designer because I'm coming from uh, the energy sector and I'm, uh, in, I was in charge at the beginning of industrial design in, uh, in the energy sector. Now I'm a collective innovation catalyst for different uh, profiles and skills to work with industrial designers, service designers, mm. every kind of designers to innovate and create a near future, new activities and so on, working with startups, working with lots of people. You have an awesome job. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, secondly, uh, Industrial design is coming from knowing a process of industrialization. Mm. It was coming from Raymond Levy or some people from Europe and the States. But now you cannot work as an industrial design manager without working with service design, right. information design, uh, product design, and so on. So people and C-level have to understand that they need some chief design officers to be able to work not only on products, not only on services, not only on UX, 
but having people able to understand which is the emotional, functional, mm. and client's journey of mm. their products uh, and proposals mm. to really deliver it. It was called the global design. Uh, I refer I'm referring to Dieter Rams. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean thinking uh, lots of years ago uh, about global design, but now service design is key because it's the way for us to understand that more and more we have to build not only at the same time the brief, but the end solution together and continuously. Because in the last years, as a, an engineer, I was graduated to imagine a brief, then an experimentation, then some proposals and so on. Now you do that consequently yeah. and, to, and every, every time uh, with agility. We don't design static end products, we design living systems and that, that's what makes it so complex, right? That's what makes it so difficult to design. I fully agree and hmm. I think on the one end we have this uh, if we, we think about our pros and cons as service designers, mm -hmm. on the one hand, we have an amazing potential to reconfigure ecosystems. But on the other hand, uh, we are always confronted to really short-term decision makers trying to put you back to something like, I mean, three months, six months, solutions to be delivered as a service designers. So how do you deal with this kind of, mm. I mean, oxymoron or controversial uh, situation? This is difficult. And this is reality for, I, I've, I, I, I'm lucky to be in the position to talk to a lot of people in the field. And, you know, this is one of the key challenges we face. You know, how do you deal with organizations or uh, yeah, that are organized or configured in a way in which short to medium term results are the things that are valued instead of the long term vision. I think that has to do with leadership, but we should make a different episode on that. Let's let's move on, Shield, <laughs> to the to the third and uh, final topic because this is the most uh, cryptic one, and it's called influence and power and. I'll create the question and is, what is the difference between influence and power shield? And what does it have to do with service design? First of all, I would say that this is just a personal uh, thinking. So please feel free to really not be happy with that or uh, discuss that. But uh, we have been talked for years that designers and next steps deal with having service designers or designers part of the C-level, I mean, chief design officers yeah. or whatever, yeah. which is great. I mean, that's great that a lot or more and more companies, organizations are thinking about it. On the other end, uh, what does it really matter for you? I mean, as a service designer, having influence of the next steps mm -hmm. or power, I really ask you to think about that. Why? Because uh, in my company or in WDO, the World Design Organization, the question is about how would you create better conditions for you mm -hmm. as a service designer or as a designer? to really be heard, be influential, be able to change the way the organization's facing more and more environmental, sociological, technological issues, be ready to listen to you, to reconfigure their own, be own business models, mm. the way they will reinvent themselves, deconstruct and reconstruct themselves in order to be part of the next years. And probably service designers are at the core center of this kind of thinking. 
And um, is it what you're saying that creating these conditions for yourself doesn't per se um, uh, translate into traditional power? And with power, I mean a chief design officer. It, it, influence can be, uh, you, you can create influence through many different ways. Is that what you're saying? I, you're right. That's exactly what I am saying. Because, um, how can I express that? Uh, on the one hand, we have really specific expertises as designers, as service designers, and so on. And whichever the consultancy agencies are proposing to a lot of organizations, if they have no service designers, no designers, it could be only some one step uh, work mm -hmm. and no proof of concept and no more added value for any kind of organization. Secondly, I think that um, once more, when you were born, what was your key objective as an individual? I mean, was it about learning things and trying to change the world? Was it about working and being able to have a great, uh, I mean, uh, retreatment uh, at the end of your uh, life, job life? Uh, at the year of 60 or 70 years old, was it about? As designers, I think we want to change the world. Mm -hmm. The question is about how can we do that? And if you have in mind that there is not only the uh, chief designer's position's objective, and I remember what mm. Anne Enros as chief design officer, and I will once more stress what I support as a treasurer of World Design Organization, dealing and working with different ecosystems such as cities, companies, educational systems, um, obviously, of course, uh, design communities, and uh, lots of stakeholders to make them work together by interdisciplinary skills uh, and lots of people working together, uh, you have to be humble enough to understand as a service designers, you can create better conditions for this kind of ecosystems to work together. Hmm. hmm. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, material to think about. And I, I, I would ask everyone to also leave their thoughts in the, in the, in the comments. Gilles, we're heading uh, towards the final part of the, uh, uh, this interview or in this episode. And I want to give you an opportunity to ask a question to the people who are listening or watching this episode. What would you like to ask them? Maybe two questions, <laughs> if I may. Uh, sure. The first one is about, I'm a convinced guy about service design and what we can deliver as service designers. But first of all, even if it's a trend now, but because I think that lots and more and more uh, stakeholders are interested by service design, and I know Birgit Mager mm. from Service Design Network, I know a lot of people from WDU working on service design and so on. One question, what does service mean to you as a service designer? Really, really. And because... Your definition will probably will not be exactly the same than every service designer's, which is quite interesting because it's a way to build something new for the future. And on the other end, service is something changing every day, I mean, for yeah. every kind of organization. And second question is about when you will be 60 years old, which will be your KPI, your key performance indicator about <laughs> what you have delivered as a service designers and being, being proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Please, if you identify some, never ever forget it mm. and work on it. Mm. Big goals, setting big goals. I think that that is important. I think so. Gilles, um, as always, 
Time has flown by. I have more questions than answers based on uh, what you said. And I want to, <laughs> I want to thank you because it, uh, it gets me thinking. So thanks again for making uh, the time to share your thoughts, your ideas, your, your questions with, uh, with me and the rest of the people who are watching this episode. Thank you for you and thank you for the opportunity. And please, every service designers, really be happy and aware of your potential. Thanks, Gilles. Thanks again. And now let's wrap up this episode. So what is your biggest insight from this episode with Gilles? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. And remember, more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the thing that helps someone to achieve his next meaningful breakthrough. If you'd like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. That was it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode.